Feels good to be here on the Monday. Two overtimes, a tie, multiple references to male body parts. That was weird. And a slip and slide. That's right. Your full Sunday recap with Darius Butler and Awesome Reporters starts now. Buccaneers took care of business against the Cowboys last night for Sunday Night Football. One game to go, Russell Wilson. We got Broncos Seahawks tonight. The score last night, 19-3. to Not very exciting. Great job by Tariko and Chris Collinsworth in keeping it interesting. But let's get into this. Uh, Tom Brady stays undefeated against the Bucs. That's right. He's 7-0 against the Cowboys. Uh, they, you know... Cowboys couldn't get it going. Quarterback Dak Prescott leaves the game with an injury, and that's where we bring in our first guest, getting right to it uh, with the Cowboys and a beat reporter for USA Today, Dory Epstein, live from Dallas. Welcome to the show. I wish we were talking about fun things this morning. Absolutely. That makes two of us, Kay, but great to be here, and we'll talk about what happened because that's what we got to do, right? It's what we got to do, and, you know, what is the latest on Dak's injury? Is there any timetable set for his return? Yes, yeah, so Dak will meet with the surgeon today, and he is going for surgery today, which I think also tells you something about the severity of the injury. They're wasting no time on this. Once they go to the surgeon, once the surgery goes through, hopefully without any complications, they'll have a clearer timeline. But when Jerry Jones tells you, quote, several weeks, Jerry's the eternal optimist. So I view that as the starting point, I mean, at least a month. And it's going to be a long haul, whether that's six weeks, eight weeks. Uh, the Cowboys will need to move forward for the foreseeable future without their friends franchise quarterback. And you were talking to Jerry Jones last night there in Dallas late. You know, I, there were all these cutaways to him watching the game from my uh, couch, and I hate seeing it for this team that has so much talent, and I love Dak Prescott. Uh, and then you were in the locker room, and the players found out from you guys what was going on? Yeah, I mean, it was crazy. Like, I was with Jerry Jones, and going to the locker room, we're interviewing tight end Dalton Schultz, and I'm like, Dalton, Jerry just told us that Dak will be out several weeks. He needs surgery. What's going through your mind when, when you hear that? And he's like, wait, so he's not going to be out the full season, right? Like confirming with us based on what Jerry told us, Dr. Jerry, once again. And Dalton's like, okay, that means there's a light in the tunnel. But he goes, I view it as a storm and you can either run at it or, or from it. And he said that everyone in the locker room is going to be running at um, that mother effort was his quote. So, yeah. I mean, several players, there was disappointment, but there was also this determination that they know Dak would step up if they were out and they want to do the same for him. Love it. And you have Cooper Rush there. There's a lot of talk. And we'll talk to Darius Butler, who's out ready to go moments from now. A uh, lot of talk about Jimmy G. We talked about it a little bit before we hit the airwaves here. Do they feel confident in Cooper Rush? Are they going to look to add as a free agent? Because even before Dak got injured, they couldn't really get anything going. If you make a move like that, you know, you got to be contending. So what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. This is the best Cowboys defense we've seen in a while. And are you going to waste that defense with what the offense mm -hmm. put up last night and the offense getting worse? It was interesting. We were talking to Jerry kind of as a group and he starts walking away and I kind of ran after him and I'm like, wait, Jerry, like we didn't really talk to you about Cooper Rush. What do you see from him? Now, again, Jerry being the optimist goes, well, remember when Tony Romo went down and now you've got Dak Prescott stepping up and how I felt when Tony went down versus two and a half months later when we had to decide who to play at quarterback. That's kind of the, the view that he, he sees it through. Do I think that Jimmy is a better quarterback than Cooper Rush? Absolutely. Do I think that the Cowboys want to make a move when they really value that understanding of the offense, that knowledge of the weapons? I don't. Now, do I, of course, they'll look around at least, but I don't think that if you're a Cowboys fan, you should be confident based on what this front office has shown at the offensive line and receiver positions that they're going to go out and get you a new quarterback. Interesting. Jory Epstein at Jory Epstein on Twitter. We appreciate you for taking the time. I'm sure you didn't sleep at all. So go take a nap <laughs> while we continue our show here. And by the way, the Cowboys do have the Bengals. And thanks, Jory. We'll uh, say goodbye to you. I think they have to come. There we go. Uh, Bengals next week. Ooh, we'll get to the Bengals and Steelers because I've got thoughts on that one. But for all these storylines around the NFL, Let's welcome in our friend who will be joining us every week, nine-year NFL vet who played for the Patriots, the Panthers, and, of course, the Colts. Uh, Darius Butler, I did not catch the F1, so you're going to have to get me updated and up to speed on that. But let's start with last night. You heard Jory Epstein on deck, on the Tom table. What do you make of the Cowboys' yeah. mess? Man, it was it was ugly even before uh, Dak went out, and obviously we had concerns. Um, you know, with, with only one quarterback on the roster behind Dak, Cooper Rush was bought in, he was cut and brought back. But uh, the offense looked out of sync. Uh, C.D. Lamb had a couple drops. Dalton Schultz wasn't involved enough. 
Uh, Zeke did look good, though, so that's the silver lining. You still had a great defensive performance outside of that touchdown to Mike Evans, but uh, it's not looking good. The rest of the NFC East surprisingly got wins on the weekend, and, and yeah. Dallas was the lone NFC East team that didn't. And now Dak is out of there for six to eight weeks. Uh, that's terrible. So you got to maybe make some calls around the league uh, for a quarterback to come in there and keep them afloat. Who are you calling? You're Jerry Jones. Who are you calling? I mean, you got to go out west and call Jimmy G first. You got to call San Fran and see if they'll let him go. Um, you get him at a much better price um, than you would have, than anybody could have a month ago, been that they um, reduced his salary. But you make that call to San Fran. Um, and then maybe even out to Baltimore. You know, obviously they have some okay. question marks with their quarterback, if, you know, as far as locking Lamar up long term, which I'm sure they will if he stays healthy. But Snoop Huntley, you know, he's a great quarterback as well um, in that backup position. You need a quarterback in this league. You just do. I don't care how good your running game is. I don't care how good your defense is. You need a quarterback to hold you over at least. And Dak will be out um, at least six to eight weeks. Yeah. You know, you hear that from Jerry. You got to say, you know, it's going to be at least that. So um, you got to make something happen there and make, make it happen quick. You're right. You need a quarterback in this league, but you also need a backup quarterback in this league. It's a premium position, and they need to address that. My thing is, Darius, you, you know, it's, it's a very cute thing to say, well, just call up Jimmy and everybody's problem is solved. But if you're <laughs> the Niners, seriously, though, are you comfortable trading Jimmy G at this point with the way that the Trey Lance offense looked. And I know there was rain, and I know there uh -huh. was no George Kittle, and I know it was week one. But do you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know if they're going to be answering that phone call in the first ring. I mean, they were comfortable enough to, to, to make Trey the guy, to make him the starter. You only have Jimmy for one more year anyway, so you might as well get something for him and then just put, put all your eggs in that Trey Lance uh, basket. And uh, like you said, it is week one. Uh, Kittle wasn't out there. You had terrible weather. Even before the game started, I said, you know, I'm not even going to watch this game because I don't want to mess up my uh, view on Justin Fields or Trey Lance coming into this season. Yeah. But I ended up watching it anyway. And, uh, you know, a lot of things, obviously, Trey got to clean up and got to learn on the fly. And I expected him to have some struggles early um, in this game. But you got to at least pick up the phone if Dallas calls and see what you can potentially get. Yeah. And then, obviously, Jimmy G will have to sign off on it as well because he has that no mm -hmm. trade clause. Um, so there are some moving parts there. Uh, but you got to at least uh, entertain it if you're San Fran and if you're Dallas, obviously. So let's talk about the other side. I don't want to be that show that, you know, we come in, the Bucks crush the Cowboys, <laughs> and we're just talking Cowboys all morning long. Uh, so don't I want to get that, to you. Yeah. There we go. I don't want to be like that. By the way, I need that hoodie. I need that podcast hoodie. Will you please send me one? Got you. Okay. I got you. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at this from the Bucks side. And Brady obviously looked all in. They ran a yep. ton, which I loved. Leonard Fournette doing his thing out there. The O-line, obviously an issue. But I want to ask you, like, my favorite part of watching games yesterday was watching some of the OGs or, or guys that got traded in places like the Saquon Barkley's just thrive. Oh, Michael Thomas man, coming yeah. back with two tugs. It was amazing. But Brady specifically has been really hyping up Julio Jones. And he looked great, really great at times. Does he look like prime... OG Julio Jones to you, and what does that mean for the Buccaneers? Okay, I've been hyping him up too. Let's I've go. been hyping Julio up too, man. <laughs> I, did, I know, it, you know, he's been dealing with injuries. Injuries have been his biggest thing, um, and then obviously been in that Tennessee Titans offense uh, with Ryan Tannehill, quarterback. Maybe a lot of people thought he was washed, he was done, but I think you, you'll see him definitely revive himself down there in Tampa. Hopefully, being on that TB12 method. He looks healthy. Yeah. Tom is obviously a great quarterback. And then Chris Godwin, he, you know, he came back from the ACL. It was great to see him out there, but he left with a hamstring early. Mm -hmm. So uh, Julio made that big play, and I think that's just a flash. I think we'll continue to see him early and often. And think about it, in this league, when you're as skilled as Julio, when you're as good as, like, that doesn't go anywhere. And a quarterback yeah. like Tom, who knows where receivers need to be, who knows where he needs to place the ball, knows how to read defenses, that, that's, like, always a marriage made. Um, in heaven when you have a great quarterback and, and great receivers, even when they're up there in age. So I'm excited to see what Julio does uh, this year in Tampa. And uh, Tom, like you said, Tom did look all in. Uh, he, he had a very uncharacteristic uh, late uh, interception. Uh, and, and the running game was great. The running game, they leaned on Leonard Fournette and that running game to kind of yeah. set the tone with that banged up offensive line. And I'm sure they'll continue to get better. Mike Evans showed up. He was still Mike Evans. And of Chris old. Godwin was hurt. So Julio Jones will probably play an even bigger role. And for those of you who are exactly. into the drama side of things, Giselle did tweet yep. support for her hubs before the game. Okay. All right, we want to get through as many of these games as we can. So let's move on let's here to the Packers mm -hmm. and the Vikings because we have to... Uh, 
talk about wide receivers more. I Listen, I love Devontae Adams, Darius. I love him. I know that they missed him. That's the big storyline. Is there more to it on this Green Bay side? No, I don't think there's more to it. And, I, and, and Rodgers, A-Rod pretty much laid it out for everybody uh, a few weeks ago when he called out the young receivers, you know, um, and he said it again, I think, in his post-game press conference. You know, guys have to know what to do. And then when they are where they need to be, they got to catch the ball. You know, Bill Belichick told us and told the room uh, when I was a rookie in the league, he said receivers got two jobs, get open and catch the ball. And that, that's what uh, the Green Bay receivers have to do. And I think they will. It's just a young group. They're figuring yeah. it out. Um, but they have a great quarterback. Um, a couple of their offensive linemen were out. A couple of their best tackles were out. So they'll be back in there pretty soon. A really good defense. Who, next time, please be aware of where Justin Jefferson is Talk in the field. Talk to me about I watched, this. <laughs> I watched some film from last year. The Week 11 matchup with Jefferson went off. And I'm thinking coming into this game, like, they're going to have seven bullseyes on 18. Right. And he still went off and was absolutely great. So, uh, but I think the Packers receivers will figure it out. What do you, okay, P Packers receivers are one thing. You're saying that, that there's no, their offensive line, injuries or not, Rodgers was sacked four times. He was absolutely obliterated uh, in the pocket, which you hate seeing because he's not, you yep. know, a, a young cat anymore and he's like running for his life out there. And then Zadarius Smith was super funny as well. But I want to ask you about like, oh, all goodness. game I was annoyed. I'm sitting on my couch. You have 23. <laughs> you have Jair Alexander. He's so good. Mwah, chef's yeah. kiss. Justin Jefferson, one of the best. I am screaming at my TV. Why isn't 23 shadowing 18 the whole time? It's not that simple, Kay. Why? It's not that but simple. It See, it used, it used you to up. be back. It used to be back in the day when we were growing up watching ball. It was easy back in the day. Hey, you just go guard that back guy and day. take him out of the game, all right? But now these offenses have, have gotten so advanced. And they do so many different things with these receivers. You know, Justin Jefferson could be in the slot. He could be outside. He could be on the left, the right, in the backfield. So how do I call a defense as a deep coordinator? I can't just say, hey, 23's got to be on 18. And yeah. it just doesn't It doesn't work like that. I know we all want it to, but unfortunately it doesn't. But the, it still can work where whatever we call, whatever yeah. defense I call, cover two, four, three, one, whatever it is, it has to be adjusted based on where 18 lines up. Like, he's that good. And there's a handful of guys who are that good. Jefferson is that good. Career game Hopefully yesterday. Hopefully the Packers have realized at this point. Uh, but it was shocking to just see him, you know, matched up with Preston Smith in the open field or just running yeah. wide open with a, a rookie linebacker chasing him. So they definitely got to figure it out from that standpoint. The other issue, and I'm sorry to pick on the poor Packers here, but I mean, it's week one. We saw what happened with it's the Saints. Like they, they were a little bit lifeless. But there's this thing that happens with them. This is my final thought. They sort of let things spiral sometimes. Granted, Aaron mm -hmm. Rodgers, we've seen some one of the most incredible uh, comebacks of my lifetime uh, with him, but they get down sometimes and they don't respond. Look at yesterday. You had the Saints fight back. You have the Colts fight back. Even, you know, they have the yeah. Bengals fight back. And I feel like sometimes, and I wrote specifically down, there was a Bucks game in 2020. This happened. Saints Ooh. last year, week one. It, it doesn't just, it's not just bad. It feels like a disaster and they can't climb up out of it. What is that about? How do they fix that? Like they start, uh, you, you know. get Pouty Rogers, you know, Pouty Rogers. And then everybody just sort of like stays in the muck. And I want to see them fight back a little bit more consistently. Yeah. Yeah, like you said, it, and there has been, you know, plenty of times where they've, they've come back and had great things. But sometimes, you know, when teams have their number, they just have their number and it gets yeah. ugly and uglier and uglier. And that's what it was uh, yesterday. And like in last year, week one, kind of the same thing. And maybe it's something to, you know, not playing as much in the preseason or, you know, not being together as much in the offseason because you kind of saw that with the Rams too when they came out. Everybody knows they don't play in the preseason. And the Bills kind of did this year. So situations are situational. Uh, but the Packers, <laughs> like I said, they, they, Aaron Rodgers have had plenty of comebacks under his belt. But that one was, it was bad yesterday, and it never All really right. got going. These young guys got to figure it out. Darius, we got to talk Steelers Bengals. We got to talk about, you know, how worried we are about the Bengals seeing huge news, of course, on Dak Prescott, which is breaking this morning, that he'll be out six to eight weeks at least. But we also have news on TJ Watt that is grim and bleak and not the part of football oh, that we love. We'll talk Mahomes and how he uh, torched the Cardinals. All after this, more with Darius Butler. And then, of course, we will have some uh, excellent reporters talking Steelers, giving us the absolute latest people who are in the locker rooms on the ground and stats will join us my old friend so we'll fight about the bears and the Niners. 
back here on Up and Adams. Our next guest covers the Green Bay Packers for Fox 6 in Milwaukee. I've been a big fan of you for a long time. Thanks for taking the time this morning. Lily's out. I'm, I'm so happy to be on here talking some Packers football. I know. I wish it was like a win we could be talking about. But we have questions because there's the Packers, Aaron Rodgers, his wide receivers. He was talking to them, disciplining them. Then he was having one-on-one -on -one lunches with Romeo Dobbs and this whole thing. Were you surprised with how the offense looked? I was. And then I, I guess when you're looking at how the Packers start the season, three years out of four under Matt LaFleur, they just have gotten out to a really slow start offensively. But when you don't have the safety blanket that is Devontae Adams and you have these rookie receivers that, again, are making their first NFL start, there are going to be some jitters. There are going to be some big plays where you're thinking, well, I should have had that, namely Christian Watson on that uh, drop on a would-be touchdown. It is kind of shocking as to how disjointed this team looked. Again, you have all this time to prepare for your season opener. You know, it was, you know, said that Matt LaFleur was kind of questioning their energy and their effort in the first half. Whatever was said during locker room, I'm not sure what it was, but it seemed to galvanize this team. But it certainly was a game where it felt just nothing was going to go right. And that's just kind of what snowballed into a loss in week one. Uh, and then you look at what needs to happen, right? Health, you can't determine. But do you have any updates? What are you hearing? Uh, you're so close to the team. Alan Lazard, that offensive line, where does the offense go from here? Well, they're going to have to get healthy. And, and, you know, the talk around town is that we might not even see David Bakhtiari in week two. So that's going to be a big question as to when can they be fully healthy on that offensive line? Because that is when you can kind of count on Aaron Rodgers' jersey being clean. So that's going to be a big concern until they can, you know, physically get Elton Jenkins and David Bakhtiari, their Pro Bowl lineman, back. Um, in terms of their linebacking core, they took a big hit there. They had Chris Barnes go down. He had an air cast on his leg, so that's not going to be good. Uh, Quay Walker, their, their sensational rookie linebacker, also is dealing with a shoulder injury. So they're taking some hits in some positions where they can't afford to. But again, it's still week one. They have time to get back on the field, but it's yeah. just a little discouraging as to, you know, these big positions taking hits this early in the season. Well, we all saw what happened last year, week one against the Saints, and then he won the MVP again. The playoffs are just what matters with this team. Devontae Adams, that'll have to be sorted. But hey, at least your Brewers won yesterday, 7-6 over the Reds. Cheers. It was too close for comfort, though, Kay. Too close know, for comfort. But they squeaked out a win. You gotta, you gotta declare victory and celebrate when you can. Thank you so much, Lily Zhao, covering the Packers for us here on Up and Adams. Now, here we got Shefty saying Steelers believe TJ Watt tore his pec. This is huge news. Dak Prescott out six to eight weeks as well. Big stars going down in their 2022 debut. He'll undergo scans, apparently. Oh, look at this sight for sore eyes. He, uh, from The Athletic, please welcome in Mark. Kabali, yes. Kabali, help me. For for How you, K, you can, for K, for you, K, you can pronounce it any way you want. K, Boli, that's what I'm gonna say. How are you, my friend? I know you didn't sleep a lot, but let's talk about T.J. Watt. What are you hearing? Well, the locker room's not open for another couple hours, but it didn't look good. I was standing right there by the locker room when he came off right at the uh, beginning of overtime or the end of regulation, and he wasn't too thrilled about it. I mean, at it, it, the best case scenario right now, you're looking that it's a partially torn uh, pec muscle, and maybe he can come back at the end of the year, but uh, that's not known right now. But uh, Either way, he's going to be out a long, long, long period of time, and that's not good for the Steelers' defense. Now, this offense not good. That you know, sorry to say this to you. I mean, the Bengals turned over the ball five times, and the Steelers almost lost this game. So, what are we thinking about Mitchell Trubisky going well, forward? The Steelers would like to say they took the ball away five times. Oh, okay. Sure, go for it. <laughs> well, but they still you know, they barely were... won the game. Like that's sort of <laughs> insane. So, give me some confidence yeah. in this team. Well, it's probably not going to come from the offense. I mean, if you watched the game yesterday, it was not pretty at times. Uh, I think it all had to do with them trying to protect Mitch Trubisky with an offensive line that is relatively new. I mean, four of the five guys didn't play much last year at all. Three of them are brand new. Uh, they struggled in the preseason, so they're just trying to get Mitch Trubisky to uh, get rid of the ball quick. Uh, Najee Harris didn't have any holes opening at all, but there's only so much you can do here with this offensive line before you can say, hey, regardless of how poor you played in the spring and in the preseason, we're going to have to let you 
uh, do your job and hopefully Mitch can throw the ball down the field. It was a very calculated offense and it was an offense that was not going to move much. And, and like now you say, TJ Watts hurt, Levi Wallace is hurt. They played a hundred snaps yesterday, the whole entire secondary that is not going to get better with the Patriots coming to town. Then a quick turnaround with the Browns four days later. Yeah. So you can't be expecting these, you know, uh, defensive performances like it's the offense going to have to pick it up, and I don't see it coming right now. But I did see, I mean, Tomlin celebrating victory as he had it. They have the Patriots next week. They could easily start the season 2 and no, I'd be surprised if, you know, there was a losing record uh, in store, but that T.J. Watt thing is brutal. Kaboli, Kabali, uh, we love you. We love your work for The Athletic. Love watching on Pat McAfee as well, and we appreciate you as we bring in Darius Butler to continue our breakdowns. We're going to get through some of these real quickly. Uh, the Steelers, of course, stifle uh, um, the Bengals early, then, you know, win in overtime. This game was absolutely drunk, like taking <laughs> shots at the bar, running their tab out, unbelievable. Uh, where should a concern level be with the Bengals? I have no concerns about them. Oh, uh, I want to say no concerns uh, because obviously jo Joe Burrow is is spectacular. You know, he, he's dynamic at the quarterback position. So I'm not concerned with him and his talent, his confidence or any of that. But that offensive line, man, I think he was sacked seven times, hit 11. Um, you got to take care of the franchise. And he started off the game with a poor read, a poor throw. Minka Fitzpatrick mm -hmm. made a lot of money this offseason. He earned it from the very first play to the very last play when he blocked the field goal for him. So, um, you know, he they, that defense played Brutal. great. But not, not concerned about Joe Burrow at all. Uh, listen, you're not turning over the ball five times every game. And if you are, you are losing that game by 30 points. So I actually take a lot out of it. They, it was, they played terribly. The offensive line, yeah. new look this, new look that, didn't look good at all. But then you also have to look at how they never really, because of Joe, never really get flustered, right? They, they are in control at all times. And, uh, you know, they, they didn't get rattled. I mean, missed Chip shot field goal, missed extra point. Oh, Their God, snapper yeah. was hurt. That was drama, of course. They should have lost this game by 40 points, and they almost won it, Darius. So not super uh, concerned with that. Yeah, unflappable. And that's another thing. You got to find Jamar Chase, okay? Defense, find Jamar Chase just like I don't know what it is with these LSU guys. They just hit in or something, but my goodness. Uh, I love it. And on the Steelers side, you know, I will say this, and I would love your thoughts. You know, we can say what you want about Mitchell Trubisky. And everyone's talking about T.J. Watt and Mark Caboli was nice enough, to, nice enough to join us. Huge, devastating loss. I'm a little bit not. I'm really worried about Najee Harris. I don't know why mm -hmm. we're not talking about this. He averaged 2.3 yards per carry. Obviously, not really giving him the work there. That's what's scaring me because they need him. The offense should be built around him, and they should be feeding him the ball. He suffers a Liz Franck injury, and we're sort of acting like he's going to be out there and and be a difference maker. Jalen Warren is the backup. I'm really mm -hmm. worried about Najee down the stretch, and that might be the playoff hopes, the winning record hopes of the Steelers squad. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about him too because, you know, at least Mitch uh, Trubisky right now, you, it doesn't look like you're going to be able to lean on him to win a bunch of games, you know, with his arm. Uh, a lot of still figuring out that offensive line, really good talent at the wide receiver position. But yeah. uh, Harris, he's a workhorse. Najee Harris is a workhorse back there and hurting his foot in week one. Uh, definitely doesn't uh, look well for this offense. And you spoke on T.J. Watt a little bit. That's not a guy you just you can just go out and replace. Randy Defensive Player of the Year wreaks absolute havoc every Sunday. Made plays in the backfield, had a great interception. Um, I, High Smith, Ali High Smith did have uh, a few sacks as well. His mm -hmm. defense all flew around and played great, but Everything it's going to be tough. Right. Everything went yeah, it's gonna be really tough. Way yeah, yesterday. Absolutely. Going to be really, except for that, that late kick, but it's going to be really <laughs> tough replacing 90 out there. So we'll see how they do out there in Blitzburg. Let's move on to uh, a team that didn't miss a beat. Patrick Mahomes unstoppable mm. against the Cardinals. Uh, did he put to rest any questions that anyone <laughs> may have had? Like they're fine without Tyreek Hill and I actually love it for them. I mean, ridiculous to even question it to begin with. Uh, one of the most talented quarterback prospects we've ever seen come in the league, kind of took the league by storm. And it's still right up there at the top. And then Andy Reid, a uh, great offensive play caller as a head coach. Eric being and me also calling plays as the OC. And just wait, whoever's in there, they're going to get in the ball. Mahomes is going to be great. And you still have Travis Kelsey, mm -hmm. who is the best tight end in the game. And if you just look at pure pass catchers, you got to put him in the top five or, you know, seven, eight. 
in that regard. So um, if, if the other guys around him will continue to figure it out and get better and figure out Mahomes, but Mahomes is great and will always be great. So I worked the sidelines for them last year, and the whole theme was who's going to be the number two and step up to Tyreek Hill. And McCole Hardman had a lot of pressure to be that guy, and it didn't really work because, you know, Patrick just goes to Tyreek or he goes to Travis Kelsey, and that's how it works. Mm -hmm. Where I loved last night, they don't need – Tyreek Hill. They don't, and they proved it, and they're having more balance to their offense, which is something I've always wanted for them. Clyde edwards Alaire was so involved. You had yep. all of the Sky Moore, MVS, Juju, so much depth. So, so they didn't go out, you know, they didn't lose Tyreek Hill and then go out and grab some other receiver to come in there to fill his spot. You can't really replace him. What you can do is replace it with depth, which they did yep. what they're going to need. To see Patrick Mahomes distribute the ball, I was so happy for McCole Hardman, who got a chance to get in there and do his thing. And let's not pretend McCole Hardman doesn't have 4-3 speed. He's not cheetah speed, but he's quick enough to get he it does. done. <laughs> yeah, and I will say this. All of this happened with a hurt wrist from our Patrick Mahomes, our prolific quarterback. Watch wow. out. Wow, I see Watch didn't out. even know that. Yeah, watch out, <laughs> AFC, so uh, we'll see about that. I'll also say about Mahomes, he didn't look like he was forcing things. Last year, I thought he was forcing things a little bit. He was sort of looking at what the defense was giving him. I was watching tape of him uh, earlier this morning, and it looked like 2018, 2019. Patrick Mahomes out there, so uh, maybe as, we, as the weeks come, we'll see. Did he feel pressure to get the ball to Tyreek Hill, and now he's able to – feed the rest of the family and see what that's like. Uh, last one for you, Justin Herbert, Chargers. They avenged last season's Week 18 loss to the Raiders. Herbert, awesome. The defense. Khalil Mack out there getting three sacks. Ooh. I loved it. What were your thoughts? Still, hey, Khalil Mack is still Khalil yeah. Mack. I was so excited about him coming over. Obviously, we didn't see J.C. Uh, Jackson, but Derwin James got his money this offseason. He flew around and looked great. Um, so the defense, they, they look pretty good. Some things to clean up uh, as well. But Justin Herbert picking up kind of right where he left off, just clean. You know, his whole process, his progressions, his arms. Every time you watch Herbert play, just like with Mahomes, you're going to see four or five throws where you're like, wow, this, this kid is special. And he did it yesterday. He lost Keenan Allen kind of early in the game and really didn't miss a beat. Obviously, uh, Keenan Allen is a huge part of that passing game, so hopefully he gets back out there sooner or later with that hamstring, but Justin Herbert is special. And anytime 10, ten takes to fill, um, you got a chance. He was my preseason MVP pick. Yeah, me too. So I still feel pretty good about it. Mine is too, but you know, and it, but to yesterday to me was not about Justin Herbert. Week 18, last year, Justin Herbert was awesome. He could oh, not yeah. have been better. They could not get a stop. And that's why yep. they lost that game to the Raiders. Yesterday, they proved to me that they can do that and more, which I loved. All right, we have one game left uh, tonight, of course, Monday Night Football. What do I need to be looking at? Javante Williams for me. Uh, I can't wait to see him get going. It's a lot of it's a, a young receiving crew for Bron for the Broncos. Only two touchdowns from last year. It's coming back from the top three guys. Sutton had those two. Judy missed time. Hamler missed time. So we'll see if Russ. He's got paid too. He should elevate the play of those young receivers. But I think they'll lean on that backfield. That's the strength of this offense. Strength of this team right now. Javante Williams, Melvin Gordon. So I think they'll be going to them early and often. And then it's the Geno Smith era on the other side. So we'll see how this goes. Everybody, a lot of people are writing off the Seahawks uh, coming into this year. I am excited to watch that defense play, uh, but I think the uh, Broncos will take this one tonight. Yeah, now I saw your uh, your tweet yesterday and I sent it to, I was like, at the bar reading it to strangers because I loved this thought. Every game in every booth, we should have an expert that speaks on coverages, at least basic concepts, principles. We get none of it. We got to figure that out, network. So should that be you? I think so. And I really love this idea because when I'm yelling on my couch about Jair Alexander <laughs> and I don't know what's going on, I could have used that explanation. Yeah, it's already bad enough. You know, we don't get the safeties in, in the TV shot. But yeah, yeah I, I wasn't just talking about myself. Obviously talking about myself, hand up, throw my name in the hat as well, yeah. networks. But yeah, we need it. We have rules specialists. Uh, we have kicking specialists in the booth sometimes. We need coverage specialists. That's a huge part of the game. And I'm so tired of hearing, oh, cover two. Oh, man to man. Like, those are the only things we get as far as coverages. So we need to just have an expert that can break it down and say, hey, this is what happened. It's so true. This is what needs to be fixed. This is probably how they're going to be attacked again because DBs need to know it the same way quarterbacks need to know it. So I think uh, networks are missing out. And I think once they start to do that, the fans will enjoy it. 
And uh, I think it'll be a better product for viewers and, and as, as a whole. You got to workshop that idea. I think networks will be calling you. But you're racking up the jobs left and right. I'll, I'll find <laughs> with you doing that, and I support it, as long as you still hang out with us here on Up and Adam's Stairs. Butler, you're awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. We'll talk about Thanks the Dolphins me, okay. maybe sometimes later this week. Thank you for being here. We'll be back. I got some takeaways from these games. Of course, we got breaking news on TJ Watt and Dak Prescott. We'll give you injury fallout, all your most important information right here. I had so many thoughts yesterday and a lot of gratitude and a lot of happiness for certain players who got to show off or pay off a vendetta or show that they still got it and I was all about it. And uh, here's just a few of mine. We'll be, of course, unpacking them all week. Uh, there's a new New York, which I love. And everybody's talking about it, but I got to get in on the love fest after the Giants took down the Titans 21-20. to Such an exciting game, a heartwarming game on such a difficult day, September 11th, for New Yorkers uh, and everyone alike. I cannot say enough about Brian Dable going for two and the win. Just showing the faith in his players to go out there and execute. Uh, I mean, look at this. He's celebrating with his team after, even if they lost the game, going for two, trusting Saquon Barkley of all people, so much, someone who feels like he has so much to prove. You're sending a message. You're a first time head coach. You're saying, this is how I do things. This is how we're gonna develop chemistry. I trust you, go take me there. So had they lost this game, I'd still be saying this. I would be just as excited. Uh, he was given, Daniel Jones, the business on the sideline. I think Giants fans very, 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 very much like that. That interception was disgusting. But he's hugging Shepard, you know, who's a veteran. He's embracing an emotionally spent, and by the way, looking peak form, Saquon Barkley, who had 164 yards on the ground, double Derrick Henry's output of 82 yards. How about that? Most rushing yards Saquon has had in nearly three years. Also leading the team with six catches and another 30 yards through the air, by the way. So he showed how much it means to him, to the team uh, right now. And it means so much that he's feeling 100%. And he's going to win them some games if he can stay healthy. So congrats to the new New York. It's good to see you. And I'm in LA. And it makes me sad because I miss you. All right, a team that I know and love that I knew wouldn't get much love in the headlines today. That one, the Saints. And credit to the Falcons. What a brilliant start. But look out for the Saints offense. They were down big. They were down 26 to 10. And then after coming out of the magical medical blue tent in the fourth quarter, Jameis went crazy. 13 of 16, near perfect for 213 yards and two touchdowns, leading the Saints from a 26 10 deficit to win the game. And, you know, he did it. This entire receiving course stepped up and got rolling. How happy am I for Jarvis Landry? He was seven for 114. Nobody talked about Jarvis Landry going to the Saints. He's going to be a key. He's a veteran. He's a good person for Michael Thomas, who, you know, wants the ball, wants to be his best to perform. Michael Thomas, five for 57, two touchdowns. You can tell he was emotional about it and happy to be back. And somebody I've talked about a lot on this show already, Chris Olave, three for 41. Critical two-point conversion, by the way, to bring New Orleans within a score. So the Saints had one of the weakest receiving cores in the league last year. And now it might be one of the strongest. Jarvis saying glowing things about Dennis Allen, talking about grit. What a gritty win. Keep it going, Saints. Uh, okay, for my last one, yes, we can talk about Tyreek Hill. We can talk about Devonta Adams having big performances for their new respective teams, but that doesn't mean you can forget about A.J. Brown. This game was so fun. This is my favorite game yesterday, Eagles-Lions. It was such a battle. I love DeAndre Swift. I love Dan Campbell for saying losing by three isn't good enough. That's what he said after the game. The big story was A.J. Brown, though, on the Eagles side. Uh, you know, don't forget about what he can do for an offense. He had pretty much all of their work. He had 10 catches for 155 yards, accounting for 64% of Jalen Hurts' passing yards. He sparked this Eagles passing attack in a big way. I really do think just his presence makes them so much more dangerous this season. And Devontae Smith, of course, will get some, some looks here as we go on. But the passing game was such a struggle at points last year. So with a true number one that can make game-changing plays, I really feel like we can see the Eagles emerge as a contender. I called my shot, they win the East, uh, and they get it done because of A.J. Brown's presence, what he does for that passing game, and what he does for the confidence of Jalen Hurts, who was incredible yesterday, and just, I probably ran a little bit too much for my comfort, for my prediction, so we'll see about that. Those are my three takeaways. I wanna know what yours is. Hit us up at Up and Adams. We have got to talk about this. Slipping and sliding into Monday Night Football. We'll be back.
FanDuel Casino has a new daily free-to-play game. It's called Reward Machine. It's a free game, that's right, free, that gives players a chance to win up to $2,000 in casino bonus every day. If you have, All you have to do is log in daily. You, you spin for a free chance at rewards. FanDuel wants you to win, so play Reward Machine for a free chance at every day. Wins only on FanDuel Casino. All right. So the Bears got to win. I'm from Chicago. I'm happy for the Bears. I'm also good friends with someone who uh, covers the Niners and is very fervent about it. So I sent this tweet to said friend last week to entice him to come on the show. I said, come on the show next week to recap Lance's win over the Bears. And I sent this as we welcome in my good friend here, uh, Rob Stats Guerrera. He is, of course, uh, an NFL podcast host, brilliant mind for SB Nation NFL show and Niners Nation. Stats, I have literally been disowned, told never to return Chicago. I was called a turncoat. What? This is all your fault, okay? It's what? all your fault. What? What's my fault? The Niners I loss is had, my fault? Yes, I've had Ajita ever since you sent that tweet guaranteeing victory yeah. and the Niners just laid a giant egg in Chicago. You're welcome, Chicago fans who are <laughs> mad at me. I'm the reason you won yesterday in the torrential downpour of Soldier Field. Uh, it was a crazy game. I'm not sure... I'm just going to start here. I'm not sure we can glean too much on either side from this. Can we? Like, you kind of, especially the Niners side, it's raining. You don't have George Kittle blocking. You kind of got to toss this one out, right? Well, here's the thing. It didn't really get crazy raining until halfway through the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. I mean, the 49ers went right down the field on their opening drive and looked fine until Debo Samuel fumbled that ball in the red zone. So, yeah, I think we didn't get a totally complete picture. But it's not like it was a total monsoon the entire time, and so you can't take anything away from it. Well, what did you make of Trey Lance's performance? He was what I thought he would be. He was up and down. Um, he did make some good throws, but he, he missed Tyler Croft wide open. Would have been a walk-in touchdown. He should have had that. He didn't scramble as much as I thought he would. He looks hesitant as a runner to me still. But the worst part was under pressure. He was under duress all day long. He was one of seven under pressure for minus two yards. He has got to be better than that if the 49ers offense is going to play the way we all think they can. There was a couple injuries, of course, in this game. Kittle didn't even start. And then, I, you know, Debo Samuel, he had that one beautiful touchdown. It was, and I know it was raining, so I don't know how much you put stock into that. It seemed a little like vanilla granola. Just, you know, when, that, when I see Shanahan, I just expect a little more. Did you get that feeling too? The feeling I get from Shanahan is the better the defense plays, the more conservative he gets. And it drives me nuts. The Bears had less than 70 total yards at halftime, and the 49ers just seemed happy to, to have a lead. Like, he needs to play like he wants to drop 50 on people, and he never does. And for an offensive genius, he seems to have a hard time getting the ball in the hands of Debo and Brandon Ayuk. Very frustrating yeah. from Shanahan yesterday. Yeah, really, really frustrating. But I want to get, get into this Jimmy G thing more with you, which, which is – just so Chicago understands, the city of Chicago and all of its suburbs. Um, I sent this tweet because you are so, you're just mad. You're mad about Jimmy. You're mad they brought him back. You're mad that, you know, with Trey, you don't like either of them. You like them both. And I was just trying to be positive and annoy you because I know how easy it is to get that vein in your forehead to explode sometimes. And that's what Thanks. I was going for. And then, uh, you know, lightning struck at Soldier Field and the Bears won. What do you make of what's going on? What are you hearing covering the team in and out? Just like, what's your, you know, take us into your world and your eyes with the take with these two this is so frustrating like you cannot imagine if you were going on a date Kay, okay and you're on a date with someone right. and on the way to the restaurant they say just got to make a quick stop we just have to go pick up my ex they're gonna come with us on the date don't worry they'll be in the back seat it's gonna be fine it would not be this the worst a... date i've ever been on if that happened would not be the worst date i've ever experienced okay. That's another story for a different time. But that's what the 49ers are doing. And yeah. if these losses start to become a thing, there's going to be calls from inside the house, inside the 49ers locker room saying, what are we doing messing around with this kid that yeah. has less than 400 career passes? Jimmy's here. Let's put him in and go win some games. Well, that's what Staley said, right? Joe Staley said there's going to be it's going to be up to the players to either stay patient. Mm -hmm. But when I hear that quote from someone who spent his entire career over 10 years uh, in that locker room, that's just support for Jimmy anyway. If they were bought in on Trey Lance, I don't know that Staley would come out and say, oh, if he has rookie mistakes and he will, they're going to want Jimmy. Like, I, I, if, you know, 
I don't know. I just feel, I, I feel like it's so much perspective is being gleaned from them. But you know, them keeping him is big too. So everyone's talking about the you know the Cowboys wanting to maybe pull him in, make the call and make the trade. But if I'm the Niners, after seeing Trey Lance yesterday, I'm not trading him. That's the frustrating thing about this, right? The 49ers have this window. It's almost like Lance is penalized for being drafted by a good team. You'd pick the guy that's going to need the most time to develop. Think of like a Josh Allen who needed right. multiple seasons before he became what he became. But now, because they're in this win-now window and you've got Jimmy on the team, people want to pull Trey Lance after one game. It's crazy to me. And if I were the 49ers and the Cowboys came calling, I would say yes faster than they could finish that sentence. Oof, I love it. Stats bringing the heat here. On the other side, let's talk a little Bears. You know all 32 teams really well. Justin Fields, uh, what did you make of his performance and then his slip and slide, which was the best I've ever seen? <laughs> all week, I said, the 49ers could not let the Bears hang around because Justin Fields is good enough to make one or two plays by himself that could be the difference in the game. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what we saw yesterday. He was not great. Like I said, for the first half, they averaged less than three yards a play. But he avoided the rush. He rolled out. He made plays deep down the field. And those were the difference in the game. If they had any help around him in Chicago, I would feel great about Justin Fields. If he had what the 49ers have, he would be incredible. They should be happy. And the 49ers should be ashamed of themselves. Oh, <laughs> Do Niners fans embrace you or do they, is it just a complicated relationship? Because you keep it all the way real and most people don't. <laughs> if you had to guess, how do you think they feel about me, Kay? They are not happy Well, I'll with say you. this. When I tweet at you, everyone is very pro stats. Everyone is always like, he's insane, he's nuts, he's like blah, 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 <laughs> which I love. I, I thought the more interesting part on the Chicago side for me was that I, of course, I of course want them to win. I'm, gonna, I'm of course going to celebrate it. Uh, but they were so mad. Bears fans, I've never seen them this mad. And they haven't been good in so long. And we like, we talk about their Super Bowl win in the 80s as if it happened last year. We're living in the past as an organization completely. It's like what the Cowboys do. I'm watching Sunday Night Football. They're pulling up the rings of the 90s. Cow I'm like, get over it. We're not living in that time anymore. And that's how I felt about the Bears a lot. Uh, they're so angry. Like Titans fans are angry like this because we're not talked about. We're not respected. We made it to the AFC Championship. I'm getting a lot of that from Bears fans. And I just think it's really interesting that they're so downtrodden and they're like, it's as if they won their Super Bowl yesterday. Nobody thought the Bears were going to win that game, but they've earned that. I mean, you, they have a whole new regime there in Chicago because they mm -hmm. have been terrible. And if you're a Bears fan, who cares if people are talking about you enough? You won a game against a team that was in the NFC Championship game last year, and you're going to be mad on Monday? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Stats, we love you here on the show. Please come back. Uh, anything for Monday Night Football? Any thoughts? I just want the Seahawks to lose so the entire NFC West could be 0-1. <laughs> Uh, what do you think about Russell Wilson? You think he's a good fit? Jerry Judy hopefully can get some things done. Yeah, I mean, look, Russ is a good quarterback. I think he's going to be fine in Denver. I think he's he's not as bad as he looked last year in Seattle coming off the finger injury. And he's going to have to be good because that division is an absolute beast. So you have Seahawks next week. Yes. And then Broncos. And thank God Russ isn't there. So you're playing in the next two weeks the two teams that played tonight. Exactly. And hopefully the Niners can right the ship next week because I know Russ is going to torment them because he's 17 and four in his career against the 49ers. So I'm not looking forward to that game. All right. So I need to update on Kittle. Do we need to know? Like what, when am I, when is he back? Not clear right now. He tried to go, but he obviously didn't go. I think the weather might have been a part of that. Hopefully he can come back next week, but no definitive word on him and no definitive word on Elijah Mitchell, who left this game I in the know. first half. Although Kyle Shanahan does speak later to get today, so we should have some clarity. And there. he loves giving clear answers. So they're going to enjoy that press conference. <laughs> Rob Stats Guerrero, check him out over on SB Nation. We appreciate you, Stats. You're awesome. We'll be back. Bears are one to know. You know who they have next week? The Packers. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. we got a big Monday Night Football game to wrap up week one action. And away we go. Let's ride. Let's ride. Broncos. Let's ride. Perfect. Okay. One more time. Broncos country, let's ride. Broncos country, let's ride. Broncos country, let's ride. Broncos country, let's ride. Up and Adam show, let's ride. Uh, okay, we played that once, so Brian, we're not playing that ever again. 
We have a one per week Last play of that. Week. You know what, I'll say this, we bring in Conrad Company, who's a producer. I don't, do you think that Russell Wilson made that up as we wind down here on a Monday? Or do you, or do you think the producer said, do this? Because I've been in that situation a lot. I mean, you, we did a photo shoot here and it's, will you hold money? Will you, you know, do this? Will you have a football like you're a running back? And I'm like, absolutely not because you will use that. But producers and people behind the scenes try to trick you into doing stuff. No, that's been Russell from day one. Look at Wisconsin, on Wisconsin with the Seahawks, go Hawks. And yeah. then his Broncos Nation, let's ride. He has to have it. He has to have it. But more importantly, Look at us today. I know. Are we, are we, are we matching? Do we, do we plan this? Oh, we're like brother and sister. I love you, Conrad <laughs> Company. Huge matchup tonight. Russell Wilson going back to Seattle. All the emphasis is on that. I am fascinated to see how he performs with Jerry Judy and Cortland Sutton around him. Uh, the pressure, look it. Broncos haven't played. Pressure's on them to keep yep. pace in the AFC West with things that are going on. Chargers and Chiefs already both 1-0 and to start the season. We had Darius Butler on who said Javante Williams is who you should be watching. And he also, what did he call his shot on? That somebody would have a touchdown? DK Metcalf. DK Metcalf would have a touchdown. I will add Jerry Judy will score tonight as my bold prediction for this evening. Do you have one, my friend? Uh, I don't necessarily have a bold prediction. I just think that Russell Wilson comes in and cooks the Hawks tonight. Yeah. I, th I think that he wants blood. Those are your Hawks. Well, they are my Hawks, but Pete Carroll had some weird stuff to say. He's like, should the fans boo Russell? And he's like, I don't don't know man in between the lines we'll see what it is you know what russell wilson thank you for the nine years in seattle it's yeah. much appreciated who, stay, who steps up and is a leader you can say it, russell wilson is an absolute leader so without him in the post russell wilson era in seattle who steps up there uh is this a rashad penny game i'll just tell you he he rushed for 134 yards per game with six touchdowns over right. the seahawks last five games so he might pick up where he left off. Uh, that's it for us here on Up and Adams. We will be here tomorrow, of course, to recap that game. You know what else I think we're going to get from him? Good high fives. Ooh, a lot of high practice five high footage? fives. A lot Can of it. Can us out today? What am I doing? <laughs> what is this? No? No high five footage from Russell Wilson? That's okay. We'll see you. Yeah! Practicing his high fives. Well, I don't know about that. We'll see you tomorrow. Good luck. <laughs>